concern about it, but many people say uh, your party's position has been rather confusing on this uh, very important issue of national concern. First, I want to begin by telling you that my party position has not changed and is not changing. And the Secretary General of the ODM, Mr. Edwin Sifuna, issued a, a statement on the party position on this issue of uh, uh, the COVID uh, uh, fund scandal. And um, he was very clear. He stated very clearly that we want to get to the bottom of this matter. We want a proper investigation carried out by professionals. And he actually talked about an audit of the books of the Ministry of Health from the beginning up to where we are right now. Because that is what is going to reveal the picture at the Ministry of, of Health. Right now, there's a lot of shouting and a lot of cacophony that no, nobody knows who is telling the truth. The main scandal, which I handled as the Prime Minister, we appointed Price Waterhouse Coopers, a firm of, of auditors, who investigated and it's actually on that basis that I suspended the Minister for Agriculture uh, uh, to allow for uh, more investigations. Um, and uh, then you remember the one of the NYS. The Auditor General carried out a special audit of the NYS scandal. And he's the one who came up with all those names as a result of which it was now easier for the uh, DPP to carry out prosecution. I, I, I understand that. that that's, that's history. Now, my, my question then becomes this. I mean, you've called on for an audit. The report obviously would be given to the current uh, agencies that we're dealing with. And yet we've seen a lot of rot in the Ministry of Health. At a certain point, uh, Mr. Odinga, you, you, you referred to it as a scandal that touched on people very close to the president at that time, at a different time, and you said, in fact, at the time, it was a president's scandal. Do you have confidence that this government can actually get to the bottom of the road, particularly at the Ministry of Health? What I'm trying to say is that whether the government is going to act is a different matter. The most important thing, let the facts come out. At the moment, the facts are not there. But you would admit that whether it's a judicial commission of inquiry, whether it's a special audit, ultimately the political will to implement or to follow through and get the culprits, bring them to book, is so important. And so do you have confidence that the government as it is now can get to the bottom of it and tell the country what really happened? We saw with the, with the case of, for example, NYA, some people were taken to court. The matters have been dragging the courts um, uh, up to now. Uh, I have really no reason to, 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 to now suggest that if, for example, an audit came out and people, were, uh, were names were, were, were produced, that no action will be taken. I think let us not uh, try to anticipate uh, and, uh, and wait for it. Because it will be then easier for us to say, look, an audit has been carried out. These people have been found to be culpable. Let them now face the music. We can then uh, put pressure on the government. At the moment, you see, the president has, uh, has uh, ordered that the DCI or ESCC should move in to investigate. Uh, I think that is probably that's on the basis of the advice was given by his, his people. I am actually advising him not to send those prosecutorial agencies, but instead allow for a professional audit to be carried out at the Ministry of Health. Criticisms that we've had uh, of your party at, at the moment seem to be part of a, a larger conversation that's going on in the country where your critics are saying that you're not the Raila Odinga who used to put the government under a lot of pressure, that uh, in a way your party has abdicated its opposition role of keeping the government in check. Is that a fair criticism, Mr Odinga? Very, very unfair criticism. Because as you can see, if my party want, want to defend government, they would not be calling for audits, okay? 
they would just be dismissing these things as uh, hearsay or, or, or empty allegations. They want to divide people's attention. At the moment, ODM is becoming a scapegoat for those very same politicians to divide people's attention. They are now wanting to come out as Mr. Clean, when, of course, it is known uh, where they stand in as far as the war on corruption is concerned. ODM has nothing to hide. And ODM is not going to answer for the criminals. ODM wants these things to be properly investigated. But there are people who want just to tarnish ODM with uh, this thing of... of uh, it, it's, uh, it's politics. Mm -hmm. Political campaign. Why, why ODM? Why are they targeting? I mean, in the past, ODM has not been in this position before. They see ODM as a, a serious a, a political challenger. But, but what about the fact that because you are in uh, the handshake with the president, you have a relationship with the president in that way, are you genuinely able to raise issues that are happening in government, keep the government in check without jeopardizing the handshake? The handshake is based on basic principles, and those are encapsulated in the Memorandum of Understanding, which we signed jointly with the President. The issues that we said needed to be addressed in order to be able to unify this country. And that's why it's called Building Bridges Initiative. One of those is the war against corruption. Uh, uh, the other one is ethnicity. Uh, the other one is um, um, uh, discrimination in terms of opportunities in, in the country, uh, e equity and equality uh, in terms of resource sharing in the country. So uh, um, because of that, you can, you can see that uh, what we are doing is very much part and parcel of what is contained in the BBI. Let's turn now to the issue of the 10th anniversary of the Constitution, and this 10th anniversary is coming at a time when you are associated with the move or the push to amend the Constitution that was passed in 2010. The people who would say it's only been 10 years. Do you think this is not too early to amend the Constitution? What is this thing that is pressing that makes you believe that we should actually change this Constitution? Joe, there are some people who completely miss the point. The Constitution is not a rigid document that um, uh, cannot be uh, amended. Uh, the longevity uh, before um, amending the Constitution does not in any way speak to uh, its prudence or in terms of answering to the aspirations of our people. You take, for example, the, 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 the one of the most um, uh, revered constitutions in the world, that of the United States of America. It was re revised within months uh, after it was promulgated. In a, the national team that went there, consisted of members of parliament, politicians. It was not as representative as the group that assembled at Bomas of Kenya. These are people with the vested interests. That's how um, the chapters in the original constitution were mutilated, uh, and we ended up with what we're having today. So that was basically a firefighting uh, constitution. So is this an attempt to correct what went wrong in Naivasha, according to you? Or, or now here yeah, there were fewer. And now they are now changing what they could not get at, at, at Bomas. They now manage to, to get to the let, let, let me invite you, therefore, then, to go on record. What are the specific things you would like to see change in the 2010 Constitution? You see, I don't want to preempt the, what is going to come out from the BBI. Because BBI has, I mean, the, the team has consulted extensively. But um, we would have liked to relook at uh, the chapter on the executive uh, and um, try to bring it in line with what was at Bomas. Okay, Bomas had uh, recommended a hybrid 
executive, where you had a, a, a president and you had also a prime minister uh, and uh, the two deputies. And you had also uh, um, the uh, executive officials in, in parliament. That's why it is a hybrid. So you had ministers who are members of parliament. And um, some of them were going to be professionals. I think more or less, like maybe two thirds mem members of parliament and then one third um, uh, professionals with assistant ministers. Because then the executive can be held to account in the house. The way but that would be a very large executive and the critics have said it will create multiple centers of power. We remember, for example, when you're in the Grand Coalition government with President Kibaki and there was constant friction. You were frustrated and, and you expressed it very publicly in some instances. Our situation was different. You see, there was a Grand Coalition government and the Grand Coalition government, the government was shared 50-50. President Kibaki appointed 50% of cabinet and I appointed 50% of the cabinet, and, and we were supposed to be sharing 50-50. That's why there was that tug of war all the time, you know, thinking that we're not getting our 50 percent. But for example, the maze scandal that you talked about, you, yes, you suspended people, but the president countermanded you and basically overturned the, the decision. Under the accord, which was signed between me and President Kibaki, we were supposed to uh, consult uh, before making decisions. And I had informed him uh, through his office that I was going to do, take this action of, uh, of uh, suspending the ministers. But he turned out and said that he was, was not personally consulted. And you remember also there was a time when he appointed the other executive officers, I mean, uh, officers, uh, the, the chief the justice, the CJ, I remember, the, yeah, the, the, the DPP, controller budget, I think it was. Budget, uh, and, uh, and I said I had not been consulted. So there is a barber, and that again uh, went to Parliament, and it was not. It fell through, yes. Okay. But that was because we were sharing power on a 50-50 basis. That is not like one government, like they have in Tanzania. In Tanzania, there's a, a president, there is a, a prime minister, and the deputy prime minister. And it's working perfectly well. But, but you would agree, for example, right now, we have a situation where the current president and his deputy don't seem to be seeing eye to eye. And that could happen in, in a government. What is that safeguard that would be there in this arrangement to make sure that this prime minister does not have his own ideas or the president doing something that's different from the, from the prime minister? Kenyans would be very wary about that, having seen, one, the grand coalition, and right now, what is going on between the president and his deputy? You see... Kenya is not unique in this. The other countries also who have got similar constitutional structure uh, that we have, either you've got a, a pure presidential system, like what we're having now in the United States. There have been times when there was a president and a deputy are not seeing eye to eye, but uh, they have to coexist. I've known, for example, in Nigeria, when there was President Obasanjo, and his deputy, uh, Abubakar Atiku. And they were not seeing eye to eye, but they had to coexist um, for the duration of, of, of that period. Maybe this is something that requires a relook, um, whether uh, you should be having a presidential running mate system, or whether you should have a system like that what you had before where you were a president who then appoint a, a vice president uh, after the elections. And if the chemistry is good, they will work together. If not, then uh, um, you can change the vice president. Uh, like like in the, this particularly with the, the devolved system, the governor and the deputy governor. Let's, let's move this a little bit further. You have talked about disputed elections as one thing that you're very concerned about. Uh, electoral justice, you've called it. It's one of the issues in, in the BBI conversation. How do you see 
changing the constitution, addressing the question of free, fair elections that everybody will accept to be the true representation of the will of the people. Joe, you know, we have to uh, inculcate democratic culture, develop democratic culture in this country, where people believe that elections are basically a mandate of the, the people, that people have got a constitutional duty to participate in elections. Uh, in other words, you have to register as a, a voter, and you have to turn out on the election day to vote. Uh, in some other countries, it's actually mandatory uh, to vote. If you don't vote, you are actually arrested and charged. Uh, but here, we, we don't have that provision. Uh, and secondly, are the, the institutions charged with the responsibility of managing our elections. In my view, they are the ones who have really failed our elections. But it's not that because there's always interference by the executive. Uh, but not only executive, even those who are participating in elections, the candidates themselves also tend to interfere. Like um, concerted effort to bribe returning officers or presiding officers and so on is rampant in, in the election period. Can changing the law help with that? I mean, will amending the constitution, for example, deal with that very important issue that you are raising of credible election? Yes, because changing the law may be part of it, uh, where the law has been found to be wanting. Uh, those, those laws need to be uh, amended. Uh, and uh, look at some best practices in other countries systems which have worked. I have been saying, for example, I was an observer one time in the Mexican elections. When, uh, and I've also been an observer in Mozambican elections. And, uh, of course, in several other elections, I've been an observer in Nigeria, I've uh, been an observer in uh, Lesotho, I've been an observer in several international elections. But those particular ones stand out, the one in Mexico and in Mozambique. Because there, uh, they, uh, because they were, they were countries which were merging from single party systems to multi party systems. And they adopted uh, an electoral commission that had uh, uh, parties nominating uh, members. Because they go from the position that no individual is neutral. They say, even if you take the Pope and give him a ballot, you go into the box, you will vote for somebody. So they say that, therefore, in this electoral process, anybody who is a, who is a citizen of the country has got his bias, his preference. So therefore, they say that the parties nominate the, the commissioners. And uh, when, when they're there, you see, there's a, the majority party and the minority party, they nominate the commissioners. So those commissioners actually check each other. See, they, they, they kind of check each other. So and, and that's a, a, seen to be working very well. Okay, so, so we will take a very short break, but I want to ask you this last question before we do that. You have been very categorical about the issue of a referendum, and you've been saying it will happen before 2022. Looking at this, we have less than two years before that election. Is it logistically, perhaps even financially possible to hold that now? You need to look at what they do in Europe. They can do even two elections in one year. So this issue of the time is too short, actually, my view completely misses the point. The issue is that, is it necessary? That's the question. Is there a commission to do it? I mean, the IABC is in tatters. Even as fully formed as it was, you had big issues with it. The Supreme Court discredited it. Now it has three people or something like that. Do you truly believe it can conduct a, an, a referendum that Kenyans would have confidence in? You can appoint the four new commissioners 
uh, that being diluting and, and, and have those the three other commissioners resign uh, or, or whatever it is and, and then you, you, you form a new commission. So my view that is not the reason for not having a referendum. All right. Thank you, Mr. Odinga. We have a couple more questions, but we're going to take a, a short break. We'll be right back with our conversation with Raila Odinga, ODM party leader, uh, former prime minister, talking about 10 years of the 2010 constitution. Katiba at 10 will be back in a short while. Mm -hmm.